When we play games, we don't always consider the moral aspects of what we do. We cheat, we steal, and we kill. So much killing. And while we all do things in games we'd hopefully never do in real life, perhaps the cleverest thing here is that we barely even notice any of this happening. In this video, we'll be talking about the psychological tricks games use to make us abandon morality, the reasons why people online are more hostile than they are in real life, and the secret methods in play that make us feel fine about pulverizing even the cutest monsters. Sorry, we're not sorry, whatever you are. Here are seven ways games make us feel fine about doing terrible things. Our first entry is a straightforward one. Games usually give us a solid reason to fight. A recent article on Gama Sutra asked various developers how they create enemies that are easy for players to kill, and the answers are helpful in making us understand how our brains work. Often, morality is the motivation. You want to kill Nazis in Wolfenstein because they're an authoritarian regime responsible for the death of millions. And you're unlikely to stop and sympathize because hero BJ Blauskowitz has personally suffered at their hands. Likewise, in The Binding of Isaac, it's okay for you to attempt matricide because your mum has locked you in a basement and wants to kill you. Elsewhere, the reasons are more mercenary. If we expand the concept of loot to include any valuable materials we get from killing enemy NPCs, it's easy to see why we're so free and easy with the murder. There's always something in it for us. Whether you're skinning animals to make new wallets in Far Cry 3, or battling the wildlife of Assassin's Creed Origins, enemies come to represent a means to an end. And even in old school games, where you collect materials that make no sense, such as coins or fruit, it's still motivation to progress through the level killing everything in your path. Skinning an animal for resources might feel more immersive, but mechanically, it's no different from a shiny pixelated coin. That brings us onto our second point and an entry that's covered in depth in the Gama Sutra article. One of the most important elements of design is making sure the player doesn't connect with the thing they're killing. And for most games, this means that enemy NPCs can't be too cute. Animals work especially well as enemies as seen in games like Flame in the Flood because we already have an established reaction to them. We know that if we see a snake or a massive spider in a game, it's unlikely to be a friendly NPC ready to hand out quests. And we know that animals in real life fight to protect their territory or to feed themselves. The game doesn't need to tell us this because we inherently understand it. Titles like Flame in the Flood reinforce the danger animals pose by reflecting this in their design. Wolves are deformed to look more threatening, with elongated legs and sharp jaws. This is done deliberately, so you don't mistake them for your pet Shiba Inu. And the difference between dogs and wolves in Skyrim is especially pronounced. One looks like it wants to tear your throat out, the other looks a bit like your granddad. Nino Kuni also uses clever design to mark out dangerous enemies, even though they feel unfamiliar and fantastical. The friendly mobs are all round and bouncy, whereas the enemy creatures look a bit like this. But interestingly, as we'll see in our next entry, games sometimes need cute enemies to make certain types of player fight. What in the... Oh, you two! You can see my little lovelies, can't you? Why not have them lend you a hand? While grown-up gamers need threatening enemies to motivate them, the approach with children's games has to be different. If an enemy is too frightening, most children will turn the game off and run away, which coincidentally is exactly what I want to do when I'm playing The Binding of Isaac. In these cases, games need to make enemies feel approachable and antagonistic, imparting a sense that new players will win the fight if they try it. To do this, developers use safe designs with soft edges, which don't feel quite so dangerous. The Gama Sutra article references the slimes from Dragon Quest. They look harmless and approachable, and young players don't feel bad about squashing them. As with so many elements of game design, this one is all about balance. Enemies need to be recognizable as such, but players also need to feel okay about engaging them. And as we'll see in our next entry, having empathy with an enemy can cause problems. When you look at the most common types of enemies in games, you begin to see a pattern – zombies, robots, and threatening aliens. This is because we're much happier killing creatures that we can't empathize with. By removing things like emotion or the ability to feel pain, developers can make it easier for us to sit back and enjoy the zombie apocalypse. Now, we sometimes complain about every game having zombies, but they really are the perfect enemy. 
Even though they look human, they're devoid of the qualities that allow us to connect with them. They're rarely unique and they don't have personalities, so killing them feels no different from mowing the lawn. And this is why most enemies in games don't have any ambiguity. Even in titles where you're fighting human beings, like Wolfenstein or Tomb Raider, it's rare that you come across a baddie who's anything other than outright evil. And Wolfenstein even goes a step further, obscuring the faces of goons you're already predisposed to hate. And when you do see enemy faces, they're often disfigured or scarred, primarily to remind you of a specific reason you have to dislike them. But what happens when your enemies are other humans with nothing marking them out as evil? Well, developers have a trick for that too. They use contrasting NPCs to hammer home which ones are good and which ones are bad. Bioshock Infinite is a fine example. During your tour of Colombia, you can stumble across cheerful families playing sideshow games and eating candy floss. There are times when it doesn't feel like an FPS at all, but more like a real place. And then when the combat starts, you know exactly who your enemies are, partly because they're attacking you, obviously, but also because the game has conditioned you to recognize them. Showing you happy children makes it far easier to spot aggression. The same is true of the recent DLC for Assassin's Creed Origins, which shows you towns full of people being attacked. You may not have had trouble spotting the enemy in this case, but the presence of innocent NPCs makes you far more motivated to fight. And again, the faces of NPCs make all the difference. On the off chance you can see them at all, they're usually recognizably angry compared to the bright-eyed, cherub faces of non-hostile NPCs we see in Bioshock Infinite. It's obvious we're in danger, and that makes them easier to kill. Another trick developers use is obscuring the violence. This is especially common in bright, cheerful platformers and old school games. When you think about the likes of Mario, Kirby or Zelda, your objective is still to cause harm even though it's wrapped up in a cheerful package. Mario is stamping on turtles and Kirby devours everything. Your objective might be to reach the end of the level, but you're squashing and killing loads of enemies along the way. But it never feels bad because of things like smart sound design and control of tone. Enemies usually die to the sound of satisfying noises and their bodies harmlessly disappear. Both things remind us that this isn't real. It's a feedback loop established by the game that constantly tells us it's okay to do the things we're doing. If you jumped on an enemy, saw spurts of blood and heard the cracking of bones, you'd probably feel rather different. And in fact, in these types of games, the more over the top and cartoony the violence, the less likely it is it'll upset you. The further it is from real life, the more you'll carry on killing. Our final entry is as much about player behavior towards other players as it is to NPCs. As we've seen, there are loads of ways games trick you into feeling fine about killing virtual enemies, but why are we so happy to headshot other humans? There's an element of competitiveness in all this, of course, but Jamie Madigan, editor of the Psychology of Video Games website, suggests it's anonymity that encourages us to be more aggressive. He uses examples of studies done on real-life soldiers that suggest the less individual a person feels, the more likely it is they'll show increased aggression. And another article of his shows that when we act as part of a group and have a sense of anonymity, our behavior is likely to be even worse. And that goes some way to explaining why we behave so badly in Sea of Thieves. And if you want to read either article, both of the links are in the description. So the next time someone shouts abuse at you online, remember it's not personal. The environment they're in could be responsible for bringing out all of their worst qualities. And there we have it, seven ways games trick you into feeling fine about all that murder, cannibalism and slime bothering. There are obvious examples that break these rules, in a game like Dark Souls for example, telling friend from foe is deliberately tricky, but most of the time developers are happy to do all the moral heavy lifting for us, leaving us free to enjoy the slaughter. Drop us a like if you learned anything in this video, let us know if you ever feel guilty about downing cute NPCs, and subscribe to Logitech G for more weekly shows and features.